We bring you greetings from the Green Mountain United Methodist Church located in beautiful Lakewood, Colorado, overlooking the grand city of Denver. This is the fifth Sunday in Lent, and we welcome you to this service of worship. Let's worship together. Today's Mountain Musings comes to us from author and professor of comparative mythology, Joseph Campbell, who writes, Holding on to yourself and not letting yourself become food is the primary life-denying negative act. You're stopping the flow. And a yielding to the flow is the great mystery experience that goes with thanking an animal that is about to be eaten for having given of itself. You too will be given in time. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Oh, that old rugged cross, so despised by the world as a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to dark Calvary. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown In that old rugged cross Stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. For it was on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross. Till my trophies at last I lay down, I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. To the old rugged cross I will ever be true its shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday to my home far away where his glory forever I'll share. So I'll 
cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a Let us be in an attitude of prayer. Sisters and brothers, let us claim the freedom Christ gives us by his self-giving on the cross. May he enable us to serve together in faith, hope, and love. May the Almighty God who shared his love strengthen our love for others. May the Son who shared his life grant us grace that we might generously share our lives. And may the Holy Spirit dwelling within us inspire us to be always in service to all. Amen. Guide my feet when I run this race. Guide my feet while I run this race. Guide my feet while I run this race. For I don't want to run this race in vain. Hold my hand while I run this race. Hold my hand while I run this race. Hold my hand while I run this race. For I don't want to run this race in vain. I'm your child while I run this race. I'm your child while I run this race. I'm your child while I run this race. For I don't want to run this race in vain. Stand by me while I run this race. Stand by me while I run this race. Stand by me while I run this race. For I don't want to run this race in vain. Guide my feet, O oh Lord. Guide my feet. Guide my feet, O oh Lord. Guide my feet. Guide my feet while I run this race. Guide my feet while I run this race. Guide my feet while I run this race. For I don't want to run this race in vain. Guide my feet while I run this race. Guide my feet. While I run this race, guide my feet while I run this race, for I don't want to run this race in vain. Lord, I don't want to run this race in vain. So The scripture reading for today is from the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verses 20 through 33. Now, among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. And so these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, and Andrew went with Philip, and they told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. 
But if it dies, it will bear much fruit. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there shall my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. Now the crowd heard this and said that it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the ruler of this world be cast out, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. He said this to show by what death he was to die. Blessed be the reading of the scripture. I grew up for most of my childhood years in Houston, Texas. I was a city kid, consuming meat and vegetables and milk and eggs purchased from the grocery store, pre-packaged. So you can only imagine my culture shock when years later upon graduating from seminary, I found myself in my very first appointment as pastor to the Hopkins County Cooperative Parish, a collective of five very rural congregations located deep in the heart of Northeast Texas, where the dairy industry was a major component of the local economy. Now, the parsonage was located in the largest of the five towns, Como, with a population of 500 people, with the Methodist Church right next door that always smelled faintly of hay and cow manure as the congregation would enter the fellowship hall immediately following the morning milking and then remove their waiters to line them up neatly along one of the walls of the fellowship hall in order to slip on some more comfortable and cleaner shoes before entering the sanctuary for worship. There was very little pre-packaged purchases at the grocery store for meat and vegetables and eggs and most definitely milk in Hopkins County. All of that stuff was produced on their farms. One of our neighbors, Patsy Evans, a single mom who was raising three kids all on her own, had an eight-year-old girl, her youngest child, Lainey was her name, who once asked me if I could perhaps feed the two pigs that she was raising for the big upcoming fair as her and her family were traveling out of town for the weekend. She had named her two pigs Jimmy Dean and Oscar Meyer because Lainey knew exactly where they were headed following the 4-H fair. In fact, all of these country kids knew something about life that I did not growing up in the city. That what you eat was always something that just a moment before was alive. It was in this way that the native peoples of North America always held a deep reverence for the buffalo who gave its life so that the tribe could continue to live. The Upanishads, one of Hinduism's most oldest and sacred texts, affirms, Oh, wonderful! I am food and I am an eater of food. And don't you take any moral high ground if you happen to be a vegetarian, because that tomato that you're consuming was also alive before you ripped it from its vine source 
and butchered it up for the salad that you're now eating. Life lives on lives. And I think this is exactly how today's gospel text really needs to be understood. Jesus' death as a necessary gift offered in love and received with gratitude and reverence for the life it brings to the rest of the whole wide world. Jesus taught, unless a grain of wheat is buried in the ground, dead to the world, it is never any more than a grain of wheat. But if it is buried, it sprouts and reproduces itself many times over. And I, as I am lifted up from the earth, will attract everyone to me and gather them around me. He put it this way to show how he was going to be put to death. Now, did you notice what today's gospel text did not say about Jesus' crucifixion? There is no mention of an angry God demanding a blood sacrifice to soothe any anger, nor to satisfy a divine sense of justice offended by human sin, which are two very popular views among Protestant and Catholic Christians that goes by the name of substitutionary atonement, meaning that Jesus substituted his own self, his death, for ours. He took it in our place to soothe God's wrath or to satisfy God's sense of justice. That was not mentioned at all in this morning's gospel text. No, Jesus and the earliest church always taught that Jesus was crucified not due to the anger of God, but of the established worldly powers, the government and religious authorities who were so threatened by this life of unconditional love and grace that for their own survival, they decided that Jesus needed to go. But even then, Jesus understood himself not as a victim, but as a willing participant in an act of loving service. His life voluntarily, freely given for the purpose of reconciliation, of restoring lives that we had formally separated from God because of our self-centered existence, back to God who lovingly created us for communion. Jesus reveals God's love to the world on the cross. And from the burial of that grain of wheat, the fruit of an entire new community of love rises and flowers, feeding the whole wide world. Life lives on lives, namely Jesus's. Jesus' death turns that whole ignorant motto from the 1980s on its head. Remember the one? The, the, the one who dies with the most toys wins. The kingdom of God, by contrast, Jesus teaches, is run on the idea that the real winner is the one who gives the most toys away. Love wins. This is the good news of the gospel. Because love is eternal and thus overcomes all other non-eternal, transient, worldly powers. But love must go through the cross to triumph over it. And this is perhaps the greatest mystery of the way of Christ, his way, and ours as disciples of Christ. We too must voluntarily follow Jesus to the cross so that through it, we may then share in his glorification 
his resurrection. If any of you wants to serve me, then follow me. And then you'll be where I am, ready to serve at a moment's notice. The Father will honor and reward anyone who serves me. Anyone who holds on to life just as it is destroys that life. But if you let it go, reckless in your love, then you will have it forever, real and eternal. There is no other way to the eternal life that Jesus has promised than the way of the cross. So what might that look like in your life today and in this upcoming week? Is there someone to whom you most need to voluntarily give your love with no expectations, no conditions? Maybe forgiving someone who's hurt you, who's damaged, perhaps broken your relationship and your heart. Or maybe caring for an aging parent who wasn't particularly very caring or nurturing of you when you were growing up. Or the parenting of a child <clears throat> who is particularly stubborn and rebellious. How about just listening to an opponent in a sole effort to understand where they are coming from rather than waiting for them to take a breath so you can jump in there and defend your own position, which, of course, is the correct one. Last week, I quoted a familiar bumper sticker from years ago, which read, Christians aren't perfect, just forgiven. And this week, I would like to propose another bumper sticker, another characteristic of Christian discipleship. Now, I've never actually seen this on a bumper sticker, <laughs> but I can only imagine the looks of the other drivers when they would read, are you more concerned with your rights or your relationships? I think we know how Jesus would answer and would have us answer. And I thank God for it because Jesus took that love all the way to the cross and then threw it and beyond because his crucifixion was not an end to itself, but the beginning of resurrection for us all. This is the word of God that comes to us this day from the gospel according to John, and we give thanks to the Lord for the reading and the hearing of God's holy word. Amen. And now let us pray together. God of the wilderness, give us the courage of your presence and power as we wander through the desert of our lives. Keep us from running back to the safety of old assumptions and walk with us as we learn to live the life abundant and eternal the life you have promised by virtue and in the grace of your Son and our Savior, the crucified and risen one, Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray as we say together, our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
In the bulb there is a flower, in the seed an apple tree, in cocoons a hidden promise, butterflies will soon be free. In the cold and snow of winter, there's a spring that waits to be unrevealed until its season, something God alone can see. There's a song in every silence, seeking word and melody. There's a dawn in every darkness, bringing hope to you and me. From the past will come the future, what it holds a mystery, unrevealed until its season, something God alone can see. In our end is our beginning, in our time infinity, in our doubt there is believing, in our life eternity, in our death a resurrection, at the last a victory, unrevealed until its season, something God alone can see. And now may Jesus Christ, who for our sake became obedient unto death, even death on a cross, keep us and strengthen us throughout this season of Lent until we meet again. Amen.